Hello and welcome. I'm Will. And I'm Alicia. This is Enter the Rabbit Hole. Each week we dive into and dissect the weird, the momentous, and the downright interesting. Today we're covering I is for entomophagy, <laughs> which is the real name for insectivorism. Yes, we got to I and I said, oh, insectivorism, and then quickly realized that that's not a word. So, yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, when we were doing research for this episode, and I tried to search insectivore, really the only thing that comes up is animals. Yeah. So that's when we found out the real name. Like, ooh, an aardvark is an insectivore. But you're probably a lot less likely to click on E is for entomophagy than you are I is for insectivore. So, Mm -hmm. clickbaity? We got you here, didn't we? So, aha! Anyway, Alicia, how are you? I'm good. Um, should we should we tease the thing that we that we have up front? We have an announcement for the end of the show, and there's your tease. So if you Ooh. if you want to hear our uh, medium sized, large, full size, mm, curvy announcement, uh, stay tuned to the end of the show. Uh, but for just now, you know, I was. Um, it's gonna sound like a really weird aside. I, I was stood in the bathroom the other day uh, at work. Okay. And I saw like a little bug go across the floor. And you snatched it up and ate it. And no, but I... Thought about it. <laughs> well, my initial reaction typically would be, oh, a bug, get away. My reaction was just like, huh, it's really just like a tiny cow. It's really just like a tiny cow. And the entire pea-soaked bathroom floor is just acres and acres of pasture. Um, no. <laughs> okay. No, no to both of those things. Okay. Because you're not gonna... Are you eating an animal that's... Or, uh, uh, say, a cow approximate that is fed sewage? I mean, I feel like we're gonna get into this later in the show. Do we know 100% what's going into... Do you know 100% what's going into your beef? It's not all grass. Wow, that sounded like like a reel for (laughs) For, audition or something. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what this entire thing is. Mm. By the time, once we get to Z is for whatever, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I want to be like, all right, baby, I'm off. Hollywood, here I come. I'm the new trailer guy. They don't even really do a trailer guy anymore. No, they thought it would be more cost effective just to have somebody go boom, 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 boom. Yeah. But I could do that. Yeah. But have you ever seen the super cuts where they're like, one man, one man, one man, one chosen man? Yeah, I, I want to be that guy. That's uh, that's my dream job. Anyway, uh, before we ramble on any further, like a couple of goobas, quick call to action. If you are listening, Go ahead and follow the show, leave us a review, good, bad, or ugly, we'd love to hear from you. Also, if you have any ideas for future episodes, please share them with us. You can find us on etrhthepod at gmail.com or at etrhthepod on social media. Hmm, okay, so Alicia, would you like to explain to us what exactly is insectivorism from here on out we're going to call it entomophagy yeah so entomophagy is basically the practice of eating insects and usually using those insects as a replacement of a protein source Mm. so instead of eating beef you might use insect like cricket powder in your bread or you might use dry roasted crickets yeah so two very distinct approaches there one is as a protein replacement that's kind of slipped into things surreptitiously, and the other is almost like uh, nose-to-tail cooking. You can see exactly what the animal is that you're consuming, and in this case, the animal is six-legged, maybe eight-legged. Um, maybe eight-legged with a little tail. So I I have a pretty big fear of spiders. Not like the little jumping spiders, but... We have a, a lot of wolf spiders in mm-hmm. Washington State. Um, there are some black widows if you go over the mountains. And there's just a lot of spiders. In, in the wintertime, they'll usually come inside the house. Because if it's cold outside for that, for you, it's cold outside for them. Let them in, guys. Take them in, folks. Take a black widow into your home. 
I have once been trapped in my closet because there was a spider in there and I was terrified that if I took my eyes off of it, it would disappear into my clothes and the next time I put on, like, my sweater, there'd be, like, a little spider friend in there. Mm -hmm. Also, I have had a dream that I've had a spider crawling over me and, like, swept it off my face and then woken up to find a real spider next to me which had been crawling on me. Oh, okay. So, (laughs) I... All of this to say is that I do have a fear of insects, and so the idea of eating insects to me is quite terrifying. Yeah, so we're not coming, we're not rolling up in here today to give you guys the hard sell and be like, I mean, you clearly have an aversion to uh, insects. I'm okay with most insects, and but above six legs, so we're talking spider scorpion centipedes. Oh god. Uh, No, no thank you. We had... Another aside, we we live in Taiwan. Uh, occasionally there are huntsman spiders here. Mm-hmm. Um, we have two sugar gliders, and the sugar gliders were, will bark at night, and we couldn't figure out why they were barking so much until we came into the room and saw a huntsman spider as big as your hand. And both of us were too afraid to kill it. We had to get, like, was it like One a Swiffer kind of thing and, like, launch it at the spider. I, I had to take care of it. And... Yeah, I, I hid in around the corner. Uh, but when I say take care of it, it was still Swiffer length away from me. And the when I killed it, 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 it was... The noise I made was like we had been in battle for hours <laughs> going back and forth and I was on the verge of death. And I just went, ah! <laughs> uh, Alicia, <laughs> is it dead? And the, there was like a couple of legs still twitching. Uh, and then we found like another one in our window. That's right, a dead one in the window. Yeah, just like as you open, like inside of the window pane, as though it had been like <laughs> trying to creep its way into the house and then got shut. Yeah, shut in the mm. window. So we must have accidentally just uh, murdered it. We and did, we uh, did... Uh, like 127 hours <laughs> with the spider. He didn't. He, he didn't chew his own. I remote. found like a tiny little <laughs> Swiss Army knife in there. Okay, so we didn't eat. We didn't eat the spiders. No, I feel like. Um, yeah, yeah. If if that needed to be stated, no, yeah, we didn't then to, cook them up. Bring little, it back around. <laughs> little squirt of lime. Uh, yeah, so we're not coming. At this as seasoned entomoth- entomoths? Entomoths. Entomoths. Yes. Um, but a lot of people do eat insects around the world. According to Lonely Planet, around 2.5 billion people eat insects on a daily basis. 36 African countries are entomophagous, as are 23 in the Americas, 29 in Asia, and even 11 in Europe. I just want to come back to that statistic as well. So 2.5 billion people eat them on a daily basis, either, as we were saying earlier, in something or by themselves. But that doesn't include the number of people in the world who would eat them occasionally if they were on sale in the market. They would Mm. eat them as like a treat. So that number, you can imagine, could be a lot larger. Yeah, like, so we have both lived in Korea and something that they don't eat on a daily basis, but is maybe with the older generation now considered a treat is um, silkworm pupae. Yeah, bundegi is how it's uh, locally referred to. You'll see them whenever you would walk through a market, you would see somebody with a massive wok, like a massive pan, just kind of stewing them. I think that's how they're traditionally served fresh. Yeah, you can even buy them from vending machines in cans. Yes, and apparently that enhances the flavor i have to say maybe i shouldn't be coming at uh entomophagy from this angle that is my one experience of eating insects that i'm aware of and it was not great i think i had it as a side dish as panchon for uh whatever Mm -hmm. i was eating at the time and the taste was quite bitter it tasted like when you stew something for a really long time. Like acrid? Yeah, a little bit acrid. And the texture was similar to, well, I, what I imagine it would taste like to eat like wet cardboard. So not a great experience all in. Does that therefore mean that I would never eat another insect in my life? No, because if your first experience of, I don't know, if the only time you'd ever eaten chicken was like day-old McDonald's chicken nuggets, then that would probably turn you off 
like a roast chicken dinner. Sure. Uh, I want to tell um, my brother's story. So my brother was a vegetarian until he was like five, I think, um, because my mom was a vegetarian. And apparently he begged my mom to get a McDonald's hamburger. And my mom doesn't believe in like, you know, stopping him from eating meat if he wants to. So she took him through the drive through She got him a McDonald's hamburger and he's in the back seat, and he's just making like, mm, mm, mom this is so good yum 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 and my mom's like oh yeah you really like it and he's like yeah but he didn't like that um the round the the thing in the middle he had taken out the meat i was just eating the bread and all the like the toppings Uh uh-huh uh (laughs) well don't eat this shit Mm. uh i i mean we're, we're we're going down all kinds of tangents here but for me i i've never been one of these people to get too uh hot on mcdonald's Mm -mm. for but when it comes to mcdonald's breakfast that's an entire that's uh that's a whole different kettle of uh kettle of egg mcmuffins so i would do a mcdonald's breakfast any day of the week uh but you should not do that for health reasons but yeah when somebody's like "Mm, big mac i'm in the mood for some chicken nugs no not my deal but we all have different tastes and i think that's what we're what we're getting into yeah so Let's talk about some of the insects that people do eat around the world. Um, Beetles are really popular. And I think one reason is because beetles can eat things that we can't, right? So in the same way that a cow can turn grass into protein for us, beetles are efficient at turning cellulose from trees, which is indigestible to humans, into digestible fat. Uh, beetles also have more protein than most other insects, and and these uh, most of what I'm talking about right now is going to be from a, a National Geographic article. So a hundred grams of red ant, one of a thousand ant species, provides some fourteen grams of protein, more than eggs, and nearly forty eight grams of calcium and a nice hit of iron, among other nutrients. All that in less than one hundred calories. Plus, they're low in carbs. I think this is a trend that we're going to see in pretty much every insect species that we look at, pound for pound, gram for gram, going up against beef, chicken, pork, etc., tofu, that the amount of protein that you get out of them is considerably larger, and that's before you even factor in, you know, the relative ease with which they're farmed or the relatively uh, low number of resources with them being farmed as well. Yeah, I think how much grass it takes for a cow to make protein for you to eat mm-hmm. versus how much of a tree a beetle has to eat for you to gain that much protein. Yeah, precisely. So grasshoppers, crickets, and locusts are the most consumed insect around the world because one, they're easy to catch, and two, they have very little flavor on, of their own, su- supposedly, and so make excellent vehicles for additional flavor. Mm, I love a good flavor vehicle. Mm, potato. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that's all I can think of right now. <laughs> <laughs> or really soaks up flavor. Um, any uh, kind of bread, tortillas. Rice. Carbs. Carbs, carbs. carbs yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was thinking more like a Maserati that just being like filled with a million flavor packets from a million different uh, packets of ramen. Mm. Yeah, that's Maserati. A, that's that... a. It could be a Lambo. Okay. I'm um, I'm just uh, working on the flavor vehicle pun. Oh yeah, no, I got it. For you, I got it. Yes. Okay. Uh, a study published in May from the researchers at Harvard and the University of Wisconsin Madison found that if consumers in Africa and Asia added 5 grams of insect food to their daily diets, 67 million fewer people would be at risk of protein deficiency. With 166 million fewer people at risk of zinc deficiency and 251 million fewer people at risk of vitamin B12 deficiency, anemia would also fall considerably. I am... So, we need to say up top, we're not trying to shit on any kind of diet any kind of lifestyle so if you have made the choice to be a level 25 vegan mage warrior paladin whatever um and and you only consume uh non-sentient plants where i you know i'm i I sound like i'm making fun of that but if you if that's your choice for whatever reasons fair play if you are 
a lacto ovo vegetarian hey you know that's fine as well if if you're eating meat seven days a week whatever but we're here to present some uh alternative ideas that other people are implementing that other people have been implementing for a long time and again one of the trends that seems to come up when you examine insects versus other food sources is you're getting those vitamins you're getting those amino acids that that's a big buzz term uh, that you just don't get elsewhere. And so, especially, like, I did a stint uh, being a vegetarian for about six months until I had a particularly bad day at work and I fell off the wagon in just the worst way. Rather than treat myself to, like, a ribeye steak, uh, I went to take away and had an entire munchie box to myself. People who are not from the UK don't know what a munchie box is. Okay, so imagine that you take a pizza box and you fill it with everything that's behind the bar at the kebab shop. So you not only have like your tra- <laughs> your delicious kebab meats and your pakora and uh, chicken chat and all that good stuff, but you throw in some fries, you throw in some flatbread, etc. And what you end up with is Isn't like... Isn't there also like a pizza in there too or something? I mean, hey, you know, every munchie box is unique. Uh, uh, different colors of the rainbow. Flower. Mm-hmm. But I think what they all have in common is that by the time you get home, all the stuff in there is kind of like moist and soggy. And, yeah, not great. So uh, I, I fell off the wagon hard. But I do remember being a vegetarian and, you know, pros, I feel like, um, I, feel like uh, I farted a lot less. So that was good. And uh, I felt better about my impact on the environment. So that, that was nice. But I bet you were tired all the time. I did feel a little bit run down. I was missing it. I think I was missing a little bit of iron in my diet, definitely, and maybe a couple of different vitamins. And uh, also, I I think I I replaced a lot of it with cheese. See, that's kind of the problem, right, is uh, being a vegetarian is excellent, I think. But you have to be vigilant because even though there's so many things like Beyond Meat Burger and all those sort of things, that doesn't make them healthy or good for you. Mm -hmm. They are like replacements, but they're not necessarily nutritional replacements. Yeah, it's very easy to slap labels onto things like organic or environmentally conscious or even the term vegan. I think a lot of people think that is analogous for, oh, oh, it's good for you. It's Mm -hmm. good for you. uh, Or even it's good for the environment. Neither of those things are necessarily true. All that it means is that it doesn't contain animal products. Yeah, which I guess is kind of what we're we're trying to get into is examining not only insectivorism or entomophagy as uh, a way of life, but also how does it impact the environment? How does it impact farming processes? What is it really like for um, farm to table for an insect? <laughs> good old fashioned country style cooking. Come on down the farm. To um, cricket fight, cricket joes. I got some of grandma's best beetle grubs. Mm-mm, best in five counties. Oh, thank you, sir. The, this is the strangest experience I've had outside of the Sainsbury's. How did you get here, old timey prospector? Well, just hitched a ride in my big old flying beetle. I think you're just high on drugs. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, just maybe. Just tossing trash around. <laughs> <laughs> Look at all these grubs. Yeah, he's, he's just flinging rubbish at, at passersby. <laughs> okay, so obviously a lot of places do eat insects. Um, in Mexico, ant eggs known as escamoles in, are used in tacos. Um, they're sometimes called Mexican caviar. I'm going to reference this more than once. I listened to an absolutely excellent uh, podcast on the Ologies uh, podcast series where they cover biological anthropology and they speak to an expert in the subject who made her profession around she started with primates and then how people in different countries eat things like insects and she said that you can make essentially scrambled eggs using ant eggs with a very similar texture obviously there's a i mean you can imagine how long that would take cracking that okay okay Okay, I don't. Okay. Only I another just, thousand to go. Just to be clear, we don't think you have to crack ant eggs. 
No, well, you boil them first, and then yeah. you kind of roll them on a tabletop to, uh, mm -hmm. obviously, that's how you do that. No, but uh, you, you get a very, the, what you refer to as Mexican caviar, they do ha apparently have kind of like a similar consistency when prepared in a, in a similar way to scrambled eggs. Which is, it's weird to think about the thing, which we'll cover soon, but the things that we think are okay, for example, fish eggs. Like, I know some people don't like it, but I really enjoy, like, salmon roe or, like, on, on sushi, that little, like, kind of pop, I really enjoy. And for some reason, fish eggs are okay to me. And yet, ant eggs, when you just talked about making scrambled eggs from ant eggs, I pulled a face. <laughs> for me, it's a weird, it's kind of like a weird flex to be like, it's Mexican caviar. And it's like, oh, so comparing ant eggs to sturgeon eggs, you think that's going to make me want to eat it more. Hmm, sir, you, you do not know me. Because that little pop that you just described makes me want to go, ah. Uh, it's the same reason I don't enjoy bubble tea. Uh, I don't, I don't like unexpected balls in my mouth. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so in Thailand, they have uh, barbecued scorpions on a stick. Palm grubs have been domesticated and farmed in the DRC in Cameroon. And in Australia, witchetty grubs mm -hmm. supposedly taste like chicken. And of course we have uh, escargot in France. Yeah, which, again, we... We make light of that. The Brits love nothing more than making fun of French people. If you've listened to any of our previous episodes, really, you'll know that. But, uh, you know, we make fun of them, like, eating snails, eating frogs' legs, and things like that. But even then, that's not really... I mean, that that's fine dining. And it's another one of these things that probably came about as a result of food scarcity. If you actually farm snails, they're... They're real easy to, like, attract, and then you basically just get a bucket full of snails that you can then As anybody stew up. who has ever tried to grow garden knows. Yeah, i turn that fl problem flip it on its head. Instead of being like, get the fuck out of here, get the fuck away from my lettuces, you'd be like, come, 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 tiny friends. Ooh, no, safe here. Look, a, a buffet just for you. Please correct me if I'm wrong, as always, at ETR, uh, ETRH at the pod. Nope. Nope, nope. <laughs> at as, ETRH uh, as the <laughs> ETRH the pod at gmail.com, ETRH the pod on uh, social media. Uh, I believe the way that you attract snails is you leave a thing of milk in your garden, but that could also be You leave cats. a little letter, <laughs> some rose petals. Uh, a nice full bath, a nice bubble bath for them. Or just a small white van with a little bit of snail candy in it. And a tiny <laughs> snail pervert with a tiny, <laughs> tiny mustache being like, Hey, snail kids, you like snail puppies? I've got some snail puppies in the van. What do snail puppies look like? <laughs> Don't even think about it. <laughs> okay. Tiny van has been parked in our garden for a long time. I'm going to say something. So... We, you talked briefly about why these might be okay in some countries and not okay in, in others. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about why entomophagy might be normalized in, in some places and completely out of the norm for others. So I read a really interesting article um, that referenced an anthropologist named Julie Lesnick, who has made it her study as to why entomophagy is normal in some places but taboo in others. Some discarded theories include the move to agriculture could change insects into pests, but she found that many insectivorous countries are agricultural. It's this idea of, well, we've created farming practices, so we no longer need insects, and now we're trying to kill off these insects that we used to eat. But, you know, look at a place like Korea. Korea has an agriculture base. Sure. Or Thailand. Lots of pork. Very big on pigs, yeah. Mm -hmm. All of these places still grow their own food, so it's not like it's it's scarce. Another theory was that perhaps the amount of farm farmable or arable land has an impact, but that too was discarded. And maybe, maybe which I think a lot of us have this notion of, maybe that it's about poverty. That places where we can't get access to pork or, or any kind of... A uh, cow or chicken or whatever, so therefore we have to fall back on insects. But that's not true. If we count gross domestic product as an indicator of how well a country is doing, in many countries, many entomophagous countries, the GDP is actually quite high. So in the end, it's all about geography. 
People in China and Mexico are among those who eat the most bugs, more than 300 species, whereas no edible insect species were found in Russia and Scandinavian countries near the Arctic Circle. So it's really all about the warmth. In tropical areas, insects grow big and flourish year-round, whereas in temperate climates, insects go dormant and or die in the winter. If you live on the tundra, you have no choice but to eat animals. There aren't enough plants or insects to sustain you. I, I can hear people uh, back home screaming, the midges, what about the midges? Alicia, you're familiar with the concept of midges. They're like biting fl- flies. Yeah, for those who aren't, they're, they're like miniature mosquitoes. And we have a lot of them in Scotland, uh, especially if you go out into the countryside, if you go out into the woods and in the height of summer, you will just see massive swarms of them. But can you imagine something that's smaller than a mosquito running around and trying to catch enough of those to turn into a meatball? It's it's not going to happen. Well, I'm something that we touched on earlier, which was that crickets are easy to catch. I think as most kids know, like, if you ever see like a grasshopper and like, all of us have tried to catch a grasshopper. I'm not saying it's super easy, but it's easier to catch a grasshopper than it is, I don't know, a tiny little insect. And it's also going to give you more protein. Yeah, yeah. So, like, you try and track its movements. You're trying to, like, trace its credit cards. You've got cards. a battlefront map, you know, like you're moving the little sticks across the board. <laughs> we will the soldiers. here. <laughs> we will cut it off at the west flank. Create a pincer movement. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say you're, like, uh, trying to track its flights and, Mm. you know, any aliases. You, like, break into its apartment. You find, like, a tiny to-go box under a floorboard that's got, like, a bunch of passports with, like, the same grasshopper but with slightly different facial features. This one's a cricket. (laughs) Yeah, this one's a cricket with a big fake nose. Um, (laughs) Please carry on with the facts. (laughs) Okay. Um, So... I think we can really attest to that, having lived in tropical places. Um, oh man, when I was in C- Costa Rica, there were these grasshoppers that were almost as big as my forearm. They're massive. Are you... what? Yeah, I'm not kidding. They were massive. Show me that forearm. Yep, that's a regular size forearm. I can attest to that. <laughs> For a small woman, but yes. <laughs> sure. Um. Yeah, they were almost, I would say... Maybe, like, six inches long, something like that, which is obviously not as big as my forearm, but they're massive. Yeah, I mean, this is a bit of a fisherman's tale, but the point is, they are sizable grasshoppers. This is like, if you looked at them, you'd be like, oh, God. Get the... (laughs) Or when when we first arrived in Taiwan, we went hiking, eh, hiking, we went on a trail, Mm -hmm. um, and... We went to the village that is apparently the inspiration for Spirited Away. Which, we're not sure if it is the inspiration, but it certainly um, it has the same aesthetic. Yeah, it looks like that place. And uh, in addition to having... It's called Jilfun. Jilfun, yeah. So Jilfun, in addition to having uh, quaint, quintessential... Uh, tea shops. Uh, tea <laughs> shops and its own charm, it also has massive golf ball size cicadas. Yeah, they were the size of your hand. Not mm-hmm. my hand, your hand. Yeah. But, as we find out since, uh, cicadas are also on the menu. Yep. Yeah. Eat them up. Yeah, you don't know. Wait, uh, <laughs> we should, <laughs> should we do like a public health warning just now? Don't just or? eat insects. Yeah. You should know that. You so. do not know if it's not, I mean, even if you go wild foraging for mushrooms or berries, you're, you're still not just picking things off the ground willy nilly. I mean, it's the same with any kind of wild animal. If you're killing and eating your own wild animals, they're a lot more likely to have, like, pathogens or be chock full of raid from somebody's kitchen floor yeah um so why do we and i'm (laughs) speaking specifically for me but for probably a lot of the people listening to the podcast have knee-jerk reactions against insects and i think it has a lot to do with our old friend colonialization oh (laughs) strikes again (laughs) Whitey strikes back <laughs> again. Whitey strikes first. <laughs> um, when colonizers met native peoples for the first time, they saw their diet as driven by desperation, that they were writhing on the ground to collect insects and worms and snakes. A Eurocentric perspective, Lesnick says, linked eating insects with inferiority, even though for many cultures insects were traditional staples. 
The stigma Europeans placed on bug eating in the lands they colonized persisted such that the practice is now associated with a lower standard of living. And uh, for those who have previously listened to our two-parter on cannibalism, you remember our old friend Christopher Columbus. In addition to him and his colleagues, uh, his colleagues, the guys at the office, <laughs> Jim the and Bob, <laughs> you ready to go rape some How villagers? How many native women did you rape today? Oh man, I didn't hit my number. His boss is going to be on my ass. Um, so uh, in addition to going back to... Uh, the Queen of Spain and saying, okay, well, these natives love to eat people. We should go and colonize them and take all their gold. We're cool, right? Cool. They also t would say, okay, well, they're eating bugs. That's super disgusting. Hey, that's, <laughs> that's another great reason to enslave them and teach them our non-bug eating ways. Yeah, and I think there's also something about maybe this idea of you're seeing someone on the ground looking for something maybe like in the dirt, which you associate as a quote unquote dirty place, but they're an inferior position to you. It's like look, Maybe there's some sort of psychology with that. Look at that dirty, dirty man on the floor. What's he doing? It's like, I've just lost my contact <laughs> lens. All right. Get your fucking... Jesus Christ. <laughs> judge much? Get down here and help me. Those uh, are really expensive. My mom's going to kill me. But basically, if you've come from a culture in which there is no, there are no edible insects, then you go somewhere and enslave those people um, and already see those people as inferior to you. Anything they do is going to automatically carry the stigma of being inferior. But when they do something that you already don't do, you're going to be like, oh, disgusting. Can you believe it? Oh, look at them wearing their loincloths. Oh. You're like it's sweating, like <laughs> <laughs> just sweating through your ruffles and through your army. It's like, oh, what a bunch of idiots! As oh, you God. powder your wig, oh my goodness! As you're about to pass out from heat stroke, and they're like, I don't know why those white guys wear all that stuff. It's really fucking hot out here. Um. So one thing that I thought when we were researching this was maybe it has something to do with Christianity, maybe the Bible, because the Bible has. So many stipulations about what you can and cannot eat. A lot of things about uh, what you can and cannot do if you read it a certain way. <laughs> sure. If yeah. you read it at all, there's a lot of things about what you can and cannot do. Some of them very conflicting. And if you misread it, you've got a lot of great things that you can shout at other people and tell them that they shouldn't be doing that. And one of those things is Leviticus 11.20. All flying insects that walk on all fours even though they have six legs. Yeah, don't understand that. Are to be detestable to you. There are, however, some winged creatures that walk on all fours that you may eat. Those that have jointed legs for hopping on the ground. Of those, of these, you may eat any kind of locust, katydid, cricket, or grasshopper. But all other winged creatures that have four legs, you are to detest. And by four legs, I think they just mean crawl on the ground. Do you think it's possible that they actually mistranslated that and it's not detestable to you, but it's digestible to you? So all flying insects that walk on all fours are to be digestible to you. Mm -mm -mm. Dig in. No. Okay. All right. Well, it's <laughs> a theory, guys. It's a theory. I think Hebrew has many... <laughs> um, maybe phonemes with it. Like, what's, and, what's the and word? And God said, lo... Unto him, all of the insects will be yummy to you. Yum, yum, yum. Mm hmm Rips straight from the Bible. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I'm I mean, a technically, this is, uh, I guess, the Torah, because it's Leviticus. Sure. I'm not a religious scholar. Hmm. Let's go and contemplate uh, religion during an ad break. Or just, you know, why you eat the things you do. Yeah. See all you right. soon. See you soon. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. I hope that you took some time to talk to your god. He's very disappointed in you. Or she. It, or them. <laughs> they. It. The thing. 
doesn't doesn't like what you were doing last Tuesday. You're filthy. Yeah, it knows. So let's talk about some animals that we would consider to be uh, maybe maybe less than savory, may, maybe less than enjoyable, or maybe animals that we consider enjoyable that other people think is a bit yucky. Yeah. Gina Louise Hunter, a cultural anthropologist at Illinois State University, said, quote, The taste isn't terribly unfamiliar or strong. It's almost not there. We eat lots of things that are far more gross as a concept and potentially pathogenic. Lobster, for example, is a bottom feeder and eats carrion, she told the Huffington Post. So, so by taste, is she talking about insects? Yeah, I believe she was comparing... I think she was talking about crickets, to which actually a lot of people have said have got kind of almost like a popcorn, like a slightly nutty flavor to them, which I think is the chitin that you're tasting. And they can adopt different flavors as well. But yeah, I think she has a fair point about lobster. We mentioned this weirdly in our Highwaymen episode, or you did. Mm -hmm. You brought up the fact that lobster used to be a trash food that was fed to... Prisoners. Yeah. And it wasn't until... You were you were telling me that it wasn't until um, people moved, what, west? Yeah. That um, they found, like, a whole new market, and they were like, no, trash food? No, no, it's exquisite. In fact, it's a luxury. I guess the New Englanders had become really e used to eating the these sea bugs, and they were like, oh, and then they find, like, a bunch of people who had just emigrated to the, to the west... So all of a sudden they it turned into this delicacy, but it's yeah I mean that's all they are essentially sea bugs. I thought this would be a really uh, good juncture for a segment where we pitch an animal at one another that everybody in the West eats, but could be considered kind of gross and disgusting. So do do you want to go first or should I? Why uh, don't you go first? Okay. Chicken. Okay. Chickens, even when they are quote-unquote free-range, do not have a lot of room to move around. I think we talked about this before, the pecking order, where the chickens will attack one another. So oftentimes they'll just be really scabby and covered in their own filth. Especially if you're eating any kind of battery farm at hens where they'll just be stood in their own muck. Some of them can't move around because they're just caked in feces. Also, the concept of eating something that's covered in feathers, because, you know, feathers are completely inedible. If you want to get in there, people people talk about how if you want to eat a crab, you got to crack open the shell, and that's a whole deal. But if you want to eat a chicken, you not only have to pluck and feather, defeather it, which is kind of like a time-intensive process, but you've then got to cook it. You can't eat it raw. Although I think there are some like trendy places now that are trying to sell like raw chicken or the you, you shouldn't do that. Don't eat don't do that. <laughs> you yeah, you will get food poisoning. You are gonna get salmonella. Uh, just a, a quick note. Um chicken is not the same as red meat, and red meat is safe to eat at a certain temperature that's lower than chicken. Yeah. Because of the pathogens that beef can carry in chicken. We're we're really condescending <laughs> to our audience today. <laughs> Don't eat the chicken <laughs> raw, because you will die. Okay? So, but, yeah, my point being that chicken in its quote-unquote natural form will just straight up kill you. And yet, we eat it every single day in everything. And then we flavor other stuff with it. Chickens are Ch gross. Sure does taste good. Though. Chickens are gross. I mean, it fucking tastes so good. And when you Kentucky fry it with a... You know, 14, 14 herbs and spices. I mean, mm -mm, it is finger looking good. KFC, give us money. But yeah, chickens themselves, manky, manky bastards. Okay, yeah. I, I can get it. I can get behind it. I think factory farming is probably more disgusting than chickens themselves. But yeah, factory farming is not very delicious. Um. Okay, uh, take for you will. Uh, take... If you will. A the hot oyster. Take. Go, one more time. Take, if you will, the oyster. Ah. So oysters uh, are a luxury, right? They're expensive. Um, 
They're always like touted as like champagne and oysters. Like, Ooh, feed it to your lover. Mm. Ooh, an oh, an aphrodisiac. In Ooh. your hand, pour it down your lover's throat. It's the sexiest thing you can do with your lover. But an oyster is not only a bottom feeder, it's actually a filtration device like, <laughs> it, it filters the water yeah you you are eating the filter out of your pool yeah which is disgusting have you ever looked into a pool filter but it's got a shiny little rock in it yeah it's made of muck <laughs> it's got the it's got that in there because that is muck it's calcified <laughs> shit uh and then like you know you break it open and inside, not only does it it look like something disgusting. It's like a giant bogey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, <sighs> please don't. <laughs> That's not the kind of ASMR we're trying to branch into. Um, the texture is slimy. You often need it raw, which is weird. That's like, the preferred way. Yeah. And they not only that, but you're supposed to like one shot it. I th- well, I think, but sit and think about that for a second because if you don't one shot it, you're gonna be like chewing on that. And if you've ever seen like, like actually looked at it, you see like the ribbon in it and just like the way it glistens. And okay. It, it's quite disgusting when you stop to think about it. But I- I'm not a huge fan of oysters. I do really like clams. I think clams are delicious, and I feel like they're very similar. Um. And for me, eating seafood is such a luxury and something that I really enjoy doing. Even as a kid, I was super picky about... (laughs) Sounds so bougie. (laughs) Super picky about peanut butter and jelly. Like, I would only have jam sandwiches. I wouldn't have peanut butter in them. But I loved shrimp. And Do you remember when we were in Florida and your mom's boyfriend... Was like, okay, I'm going to take you guys out for seafood. Like, well, you like seafood. And I was like, yeah, you know, it's all right. And we went to like this crab place and like 30 minutes in, I was like, I need more butter. I need, I'm just like shoving crab legs in my face. First, when, reali- when Will realized for the first time that he had never had real crab. I have had crab in Korea, but they are those teeny tiny ones that are about the size of your hand. And therefore the legs are tiny. And so, and... You're working with chopsticks. Like, that's just not fair. Like, trying to crack open a crack, t- tiny crabs, like, get what little meat there is out there. And uh, all the Koreans that were with was like, Yo, oh, this is amazing. This is so good. Aren't you going to eat your crab? And I'm like, how? <laughs> which, which part? Where's the meat? <laughs> yeah. So when I discovered that actually they could be larger and be chock full of meat. Oh, boy. But yeah, oysters still suck. I mean, yeah. Well... When I was a kid, like, it was my job to um, shell the shrimp and, like, devein them. And if you think about it, I don't, if you've ever, de- like, de-shelled and deveined shrimp, it's kind of disgusting. I, the legs, ever since I was a kid, have freaked me out. Mm-hmm. I find the legs terrifying. And the heads, like, you know, some people will suck on, like, a, sh- a shrimp head after, Yep. like, and I just find that so gross. But I think... What makes these things different from insects is that you're able to distinguish the meat from the animal. Yeah. And in a way that you usually can't do with insects. I mean, unless you're eating, uh, well, one of those forearmed sized grasshoppers that you were talking about <laughs> earlier. Yeah, it's going to be really difficult to cut into one of those and get like the breast meat or like get the ribs. So you, As you said earlier, you kind of have to one shot it, which means... Head, shoulders, knees, and toes all at the same time. Anyway, so that's been our disgusting uh, food minute, which was well over one minute. Um, Yeah, should we talk about how to farm some of these animals? Should we talk about how to farm some of these animals? Absolutely. If all this sounds good, we have a comprehensive guide on how to become a cricket farmer for less than $200, which is not bad considering crickets in the US currently sell for around 15 to 16 at 15 to 60 dollars rather per thousand. Can I just mention before you go further, this entire week as we've been doing research, we've been sitting on the couch, you know, or, or or just doing my thing and Will will just come around and be like, I want to be a cricket farmer. I think we should be a cricket farmer. <laughs> 
I am trying to come at this from a really unbiased source, but I was like, the numbers don't lie, Alicia. It's right there. We could be millionaires next year with all that cricket money. Um, I think I think I like it for reasons that we'll probably cover a little bit later on. But yeah, if this sounds good to you, you could do it for less than two hundred dollars, according to a Manuel Scrobonja at thecrickster.com. Quote. The most common cricket species are banded crickets, house crickets, and black field crickets, as well as Jamaican field crickets. The big item on your shopping lists are going to be two very small containers with lids, two medium-sized food containers with lids, two domestic storage bins with lids, a lamp with a 150-watt bulb, a small thermometer, egg cartons for the crickets to hide in, hot glue or duct tape, and, of course, some crickets. According to my research, it is legal to farm them in the UK and the USA, but you will need to splash out more for a full-scale operation. So, my question for cricket farming is, one, the noise. Because if you've ever been inside, like, a pet store, and you just hear, like, the incessant cricketing... Is there a bug in here? (laughs) Oh yeah, there are several thousand. They're here for the lizards and the snakes, um, not as pets themselves. Yeah, I, I imagine uh, if if you're already gathering up your food bins and hot glue gun, uh, you're also going to want to have either a very well insulated separate room where you keep your crickets. I think probably a shed if you have a a garden. Or a shed or a garage, although again, um the, the big thing here, you gotta keep them warm. And they are susceptible to various different pathogens, so you wanna try and keep them inside of sealed containers. You need to have the reason that there are so many different containers is because you need to have a separate breeding area where they can go and lay their eggs, and that needs to be slightly more humid. So humidity is a big thing as well. Uh one thing that stops disease the brilliant thing about crickets is that they will live off of a lot of different refuse, essentially. So you can feed them on food scraps. And this is really interesting. Depending on what you feed them, they will adopt different flavors. So one, there was a, a Verge science video that I watched where they interviewed uh, an organic cricket farmer. And she was saying that she stopped, but like she started resourcing her own foodstuffs to feed the crickets, lots of things like carrots and little bits of meat, etc. Because she was feeding them on fish pellets, and they ended up tasting like fish. Oh, yeah, <laughs> weird. Uh... <laughs> if crickets were a hard sell already, fish flavored crickets are probably going to be a harder sell still. But yeah. Um, so you could you could do this. This is within reach. So I would be curious about what kind of guidelines you would need to meet, right? Because say you have decided to become like um like a what's the meat farm, but like a <laughs> I mean you kind of are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um but say you're gonna produce like cows or pigs for meat, like you have to be very careful in what you feed them, like the kind of antibiotics you give them and, you know, how they live. I'm not saying <laughs> obviously factory farms get away with a lot of stuff but yeah. but there are rules that you have to meet and we'll talk about it later but some crickets go to animal feed and some crickets go for human consumption consumption and what would be the difference in how you feed your cricket how you raise your cr- crickets sure uh farmers do get in touch with us at etrh the pod at gmail.com and etrh the pod on all social media i imagine that there are a myriad of different legal technicalities and a lot of red tape that you've got to go through if you if you even want to open like a small scale chicken farm cattle farm etc because of various different governmental guidelines i think at the moment it's a little bit looser if you want to be an insect farmer just because in the West, we don't really we don't have that concept as such. We're we're only now kind of adopting these concepts. People who were farming crickets previously in places like the UK, you would do it because you've got a pet lizard, or you happen to know you're in touch with like a lo- uh, a local pet shop, and you happen to know other people who own like reptiles, and they can't get hold of a steady source of feed, or 
people use them a lot in fishing. Apparently crickets are pretty pretty popular in some fish species. Mm -hmm. So nobody's doing it to a scale where the government would have to take notice. That could change in the near future. So I guess you've just got to kind of stay on top of it. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> uh, so if we were talking about a larger scale operation... Uh, so that scale of operation might cover your family and some snake owners on Craigslist. However, what if you wanted to do it at an industrial level? Ooh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> gotta get me, gotta get me a big factory. So, in a 2019 piece from Verge Science, the same one that I was talking about earlier, they visit a factory from Austin-based startup Aspire. Their process is automated, and they reportedly hatch up to one million crickets per day. They grow them from hatchlings, also known as pinheads, uh, for about six weeks, and they are then fed and watered by machine in large tubs. Then they're delivered to the harvester, which is a device that flips over each tub and sorts through live crickets from dead crickets and cricket poop, which is also known as frass. Ooh, fancy name. Mm. I like it because it sounds kind of like a sassafras. I don't know if that's where it comes from. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, and the live crickets are then frozen to death and packaged as blocks of protein. So they, they then get converted into these big bricks. I think I think there are two different methods of euthanasia for uh, insects. For insects that have terminal illnesses. Yes. So they put them on a teeny tiny plane and they fly them off to Switzerland and... Uh -huh. Put them into a tiny insect clinic. All their loved ones around them have a little bed. Before this, I kind of thought they put them up a, a teeny tiny little conveyor and then they go through a little curtain and there's a man with a teeny tiny bolt gun and just shoots at each individual cricket through the head. All right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know that they do that to animals and I try not to think about it. And... Right, you do try not to think about it, because if you sat and thought about that, if you took a minute's worth of contemplation every time you sat down to eat some barbecue ribs about what the animal went through, even if they had a perfectly pleasant life, what they went through like in their final moments, you'd probably put back that plate of ribs. This, the freezing process, I think, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out and say it, I think it sounds like a relatively humane process. Insects are naturally cold-blooded uh, and so this kind of, you know, putting them in a freezer kills them relatively quickly and I imagine that it's probably just like going to sleep although it could be kind of crib if you're like oh god Jimmy it's so cold in here J Jimmy, Jimmy, wake up Jimmy, come on I, you should have gone for Jiminy oh, it was right there <laughs> it really was Steve, Jiminy's <laughs> fallen asleep. Steve, oh my god, tell my wife I love her. Stop anthropomorphizing the crickets. <laughs> <laughs> they probably don't go through that process. I imagine they don't know what's going on. And it's probably less distressing for them than it is that big old lobster that we were talking about earlier when it gets put into um, a boiling pot. Mm. Or um, as my... <laughs> I'm talking about my mom a lot this episode. Hi, mom. Um, <laughs> as my mom used to do, uh, to gut the the crab first and then boil it because it tastes better that way. Yeah, one of my friends. So it's alive. Uh, one of my friends worked in the kitchen as a summer job, and they had a lot of crab, and he had to kill the crab before boiling them and he said the way to do that is you can flip them over and they've got almost like a little <laughs> a little, a little hatch soft, soft <laughs> <laughs> like a little service hatch on the bottom and you stab them i think he said he had like a screwdriver or something yep. like a long thin implement use screwdrivers yeah uh, and that kind of like stabs them directly in the brain before you so my family took a trip to the coast with like my cousin uh my aunt and uncle my cousins and we were staying at this house and I got some fresh live crab and I was too squeamish to kill the crab but my little cousin who's like four years younger than me noted like I was like 15 at the time 
So she's like 10 or 11, and she's over there just like fucking stabbing the crab with the screwdrivers, ripping it open. And I was over, oh my god. <laughs> Some sort of sociopath. She's not, she's not a sociopath. <laughs> You stab the knife mm-hmm. in, you pull the brains out, you stab the knife in, and you throw it in the pile. I doubt she even remembers that, but if she does... Um... I really hope she doesn't. I hope that's not a fun... Ma- oh, I remember she, that summer when I killed all those it. crabs. She en- enjoyed the process, but she's not She's not creepy. If Siri, you... Siri, there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, if you can find your passion when you're young, that's great. <laughs> that's good. That's okay, good. The, we've gone through... I'm, I'm sorry, I've spoken so much at length about my family murdering animals, so let's... um. Yeah, they're a really nice bunch of people, and they definitely don't all live in a shack in the woods with furniture that looks like it's made from other people. Almost none of them. Almost. Well, there is that one uncle. Uh, so how would you... I mean, look, we've tried to give you guys the, the sell on eating bugs thus far. How do you even go about marketing? insects to people in the west mm, 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 cricket licking good <laughs> got bugs um do, what's the one eat eat more crickets eat more crickets and it's being painted on a sign by a giant uh tarantula yeah i was thinking more just like a chicken because the whole thing is like the cow is like oh more and it's working its way down the, yeah. the food chain yeah. yeah and then the next level down from that there's a cricket that's like eat more amoeba <laughs> uh and i'm like how how the fuck did we even get onto this <laughs> marketing crickets go <laughs> side note when uh when we were talking like got bugs did you know that you can get bug milk I had heard of a thing called cuc- I almost said cucaracha milk. <laughs> si, si, the cucaracha, cucaracha milk. Cucaracha leche. It's a little spicy. Leche de cucaracha. Um, poquito picante. Um, no, it's not. It's not spicy. Um, and it's uh, cockroach milk. It sounds weirdly enticing. And, and it is Doesn't exactly it? <laughs> what it sounds like. No, hear me out here. It's exactly what it sounds like because... They're milking the little udders of the cockroach? Yeah, again, <laughs> I'm going to do this bit every time. Uh, tiny stool, tiny pail, and they just milk those tiny little cockroach udders. They, the cockroach mothers produce milk for the young. And that is essentially, like, if you get enough of it, <laughs> that oh that's my. what you can pour, to, pour into your morning coffee. But because it is not, it's not lacto-based, it has uh, kind of, apparently, like a, like a silvery, sparkly quality to it. So imagine pouring that, just having, like, a bowl of Cheerios, but it looks like it's covered in glitter. Doesn't that sound fabulous? I... I'm so unhappy right now. <laughs> Yeah, you're not gonna get any happier. I'm gonna be honest. So, how do you sell bugs to someone like Alicia? Uh, Danish based, difficultly. Danish, Danish based bug eating advocacy group Crickster have some tips on how you can uh, dupe friends, loved ones, and random strangers into eating creepy crawlies. Dupe friends. I wrote the word dupe. Okay. They're not suggesting that you trick people into eating bugs. Content marketing writer Erica Eller has several suggestions, and she compares the path to changing people's minds on entomology to the promotion of sushi in the West. Because bear in mind, like, if you go back, like, 20 years, you were having to convince people that eating raw fish was really tasty and kind of cosmopolitan. And also safe. Yeah, not every high street in the UK had a yo sushi on it for, you know, okay sushi. Anyway. Okay sushi. <laughs> no shade to yo sushi. Please throw us some money. Um, so yeah, she she says that changing people's minds of bugs is going to be a similar process. And, and here's what you can do. Number one, target people in the fence. Don't go for the people who are already convinced. And don't try and win over people who are never going to put a bug anywhere near their mouth. Uh, According to their research, 50% of people in the Netherlands said they'd be willing to try bugs. So half of the population, you have people who have not necessarily tried it before, but would be open to it. It's because their other option is stir strumming 
<laughs> They're like, well, you know, bugs sound pretty good. Is that a Dutch thing? The no. stinky fish? No, but it is a... Um... A European thing. No, like a Scandinavian thing. And they're they're kind of Scandinavian. Are they? I know the Scandinavians hate the Dutch and the Dutch hate the Scandinavians, but... I feel like you're going to bring hot internet-based <laughs> fire down upon us by just being, yeah, 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 that's pretty much Scandinavia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they're Scandinavian in terms of the fact that they all speak um, multiple languages. They have great education systems and they just have a much better... Uh, way of life than we do. You sound like... like quality of life. You sound like the most positive-minded racist in the world. <laughs> right? uh, so the thing about Scandinavians, let me tell you something about Scandinavians, right? They're brilliant schools. <laughs> they're all beautiful, right? They're all fucking lovely. Uh, they've got great health. They're always exercising. Fucking Scandinavians. Fucking, love them. <laughs> fucking lovely. Uh... Anyway, I'm sorry. shout out to our I'm sorry, listeners Dutch people. who are actually in Scandinavia and also Dutch people who aren't. So, uh, yeah, target the people who are on the fence. You could do this by outlining the links that you have between eating bugs and sustainability, links to culture. So here she talked about trying to entice Mexican immigrants in the USA because they make up an emerging... Uh, middle class demographic in the USA but a lot of those people if they haven't tried bugs already in their home country then maybe they have relatives who have so it's less of an alien concept to that particular group of people uh, you could also target people who have more exposure to the wilderness so if you spend more time hiking you're going to see more bugs uh, and of course protein enthusiasts and I've written in my note here uh, when did everyone go mad for protein I don't know if that was a thing in the US, but I feel like up until 10 years ago, like British people used to go into a supermarket and everything was like omega-3, omega-3, it's full of fiber, lots of fiber. And then get your fish. kind of overnight, it became like, no, with added protein. And it's in everything, right? Like protein milk, protein bars, protein Nikes. Yeah, I mean, do you remember like the Atkins diet when that came out? It was like, oh, really? Meat all the time? Yeah, you could eat whatever you want, as long as it's not carbs. As long as it's meat. <laughs> Shove that sausage in your mouth, baby. There's no got, bread in that sausage, is there? I got you a dessert sausage. Mmm, ooh. Chocolate covered. Uh, so, the sweet lord were we talking about? <laughs> yeah, target, target people through those various different links. The second thing that you could do, attract influencers. Uh, so, for example, Neil deGrasse Tass, uh, Neil deGrasse, DeGrasse? Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson mm -hmm. uh, was invited along to a function and was asked to try various different insect-based dishes, and he completely raves about it. And there's obviously a lot of people who follow him on social media. Um, you can also so word word of mouth is ten times more effective than traditional advertising. Yeah, is what they reckon. Which, I mean, I I think is quite true because I am, <laughs> I'm the kind of person who will see a TV ad for something and I will go out of my way to not buy that thing because I'm angry that they made me sit through an ad mm -hmm. versus if my friend tells me, hey, I tried this, it's really good. Well, I, I know and I trust your taste, so I'll probably go try it. Yeah. It's all about that water cooler talk, right? Uh, you can also work on people's emotional cues. So the idea of cute bugs or flipping it and talking about the idea of starvation in developing countries and how adding more insects to their diets could save a lot of people. Shouldn't you go for like cute cows and cute pigs as opposed to cute bugs? Why, why would you want to eat the cute bug? I think people are very complex and a lot of the time anthropomorphizing something like when you sit and think about it, there's no there's no reason why we should be eating stuff like cows and sheep. Because when you look at a cow or a sheep, on the face of it, like if you if you didn't already have that psychological link between that animal and the thing that you've had in your plate in the past, you'd be like, Oh, that's dead cute. Oh, he's covered over. Oh, he's looking at my hand, he wants to be my friend. Cows have best friends, by the way. <laughs> yeah, they they Just keep that in mind. <laughs> right. <laughs> um and yet you know, we, we eat those animals all the time. I don't think you would go out of your way to necessarily make them look really cute. But I think with 
insect kind of works in the reverse because you're also having to try and convince people that they're not just pests, they're not just dirty, and so you try and make them a little bit more fun, a little bit, a little bit cuter. I think probably the thing that you have to do in the West is not treat it as a replacement. Instead of telling people, get rid of all meat, replace it with bugs, you have to do something like, here's an additional source of protein, add it into your diet so that you are consuming less. Yeah, exactly. And I think the way that you approach that is you go via the route of something like uh, cricket flour that you can then make into cookies, you can make into bread, brownies, etc. Or cricket-based protein bars or crisps, etc. So that people have gotten over that initial mental hurdle of, oh, I just ate a bug. Oh, that was weird. Okay, it wasn't terrible. And they're then willing to move into, okay, well, I could try different bugs. And then maybe eventually I'm eating some, I'm eating an actual bug and look at it and it's looking at me, but that's fine. That's okay. So yeah, they have a lot of different tips and tricks for how to, how to kind of push that out. Should we take another break? Already? Oh, <laughs> sorry, sorry to blindside you there. Yeah, we're going to take another break. And welcome back. Okay, so now we've talked a lot about insects, let's talk about some pros uh, in, in farming insects. So specifically, I'd like to focus on the environment and health benefits. In March 2017, um, Hugel, who is a cricket expert, received an email from a fellow entomologist, Brian Fisher, asking about an edible cricket that could be farmed in Madagascar. Nearly 80% of Madagascar's forest coverage has been destroyed since the 1950s, and 1-2% to of what remains is cut down each year as farmers clear more trees to make room for livestock. The only way to prevent this, Fisher told Hugel in his emails, was to give locals an alternative source of protein. If you want to be able to keep studying your insects, we need to increase food security. Otherwise, there will be no forest left, Fisher wrote. This is according to a Time magazine article. The United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, or FAO, says that agricultural production worldwide will have to increase by 70% in order to feed a global population expected to reach 9.1 billion by 2050. It's a really weird change in career path for LMFAO. Like, last time we heard from them, it was sexy, and I know it, and now they're producing, like, these articles outlining ideas for the way that people should feed themselves. They've really matured as artists. Yeah, I mean, I guess you can only, like, dip from that well so many times before you're like, all right, now we've got to wear suits and hot pants. How many times can we shuffle? Hmm. Um, so, agriculture is one of the biggest drivers of natural destruction, threatening 86% of the 28,000 species most at risk of extinction. So pound for pound, insects require less land, water, and feed than traditional livestock. Insect farming and processing produces significantly lower greenhouse gas emissions. And not only do insects produce less waste, their excrement, called frass, is an excellent fertilizer and soil amender. One small caveat there. In general, insects do produce like a negligible amount of uh, greenhouse gases, specifically methane. You've probably already ha heard about the cow burps. The cow burps are enhancing the greenhouse gas effect, or the, yeah, the greenhouse effect. The exception in the insect kingdom are termites, apparently. Yeah, so, I've heard about termites. Yeah, because... I've heard about these termites. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty, I've heard about those insects. Pretty good guys. Pretty good. Uh, earlier we were talking about how beetles break down cellulose because they're eating tree bark. Termites, specific species of termites anyway, do something similar in order to build their mounds. And a byproduct of that is producing a lot of methane. So if all of these farmers were to rush out and start 
mass farming termites, then we, we would just be trading one problem for another. It also seems like an accident waiting to happen. All I can imagine is them getting out of their plastic bucket and then just like, and the house is just sawdust. Like, like a cartoon, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The house is just kind of, it turns into like a fuzzy line before mm-hmm. it turns into a pile of chips. Well, I mean, these, these things have happened in the past and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Ooh. Um, so Hugo and Fisher, those two entomologists that I talked about earlier, launched a cricket farm in... Oh, boy. The capital of Madagascar. You want to give it a go? Where am I looking here? And... 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 Antanavirino? Mm -hmm. (laughs) If I see too many A's and N's, my brain just uh, stops working. Okay. This protein-packed, fiber-rich powder is now being used by international aid agency Catholic Relief Services for countrywide famine relief projects, as well as school lunch programs and in tuberculosis treatment centers where patients often struggle to get adequate nutrition. In Madagascar, villagers were eating lemurs and other endangered animals in order to get the protein they needed. How to get them to stop was a problem. Once you got a taste of that sweet, sweet lemur meat as well... All that bouncing they do, all that joyous play, it really, like, mm, makes that, that leg muscle real tender. So <laughs> Don't even get me started in the tail. Like, deep-fried lemur tail? Oh, God. Um, Melts in your mouth. I can't remember the name of this. Um, I don't know if she's an entomologist, but basically she was doing studies on how to stop deforestation and how to stop... Um, how to save the lemurs, basically, because they're endangered. Mm -hmm. And so she couldn't find a way to get them to eat more farmland without destroying, like eat more farm animals without destroying more forest and therefore endangering the lemurs even more. So she tried to ask them, like, what else besides, you know, chicken and these endangered animals do you enjoy eating? And along with pork and chicken, she heard about something called uh, secondary. It's this plump insect that supposedly tastes like fried pork cubes. It's crunchy on the outside and fatty on the inside. And she said that even her children, because she, she's from the Midwest, even her children would eat them and enjoy them. And she's like, oh, that's asking a lot for American children. I just want to like cycle back a little bit. I imagine when she was trying to ask these Madagascan farmers what they would eat she put down like a laminated mcdonald's menu in front they were all sat in the back seat of her car just kind of like kicking the back seat and she was like okay well what do you want do you want some nuggies and they're like no no it's like okay do you do you want do you want a burger and they're like no don't want a burger what's the country do you want some do you want some beetles and they're like what kind of beetles <laughs> okay and uh, then they fell asleep on the drive home just another way to infantilize people who are <laughs> I do not legitimately think that she put a McDonald's menu in front of farmers and asked them what, what they wanted to eat. Of course, she surveyed all these people to find viable food sources. Mm-hmm. I just like the idea. So, the difficulty was making this uh, insect more available for the locals to eat since they can be quite hard to find. Eventually, they found that these insects really enjoy a specific bean plant, and so they planted all of these plants closer to the village so that people would have more access to the insects, and they found that lemur poaching in the area has gone down by 30 to 50%. Which is great. Yeah. Right? I'm just, that's a huge number. Yeah. Like, I know it doesn't sound, oh, 30%, but for one thing to have impacted poaching but that much is is massive yeah um, unless you don't like lemurs and i'm struggling to imagine the kind of person who's like fucking lemurs maybe somebody who's seen um what's the madagascar, madagascar? yeah the movie madagascar the, after we were talking about the country madagascar and you're like what's the <laughs> the name it's uh oh, tip of my tongue i th- toy for, story for in my head i thought it was escape something i'm like, pretty sure that is the penguin based spin-off uh, I, I could be wrong yeah like escape from madagascar okay or um, escape from alcatraz so according to the fao there are no known cases of transmission of diseases or parasite 
parasitoids, parasite, parasitoids, parasites. Those are like parasites that have been Roided taking up. steroids. <laughs> I'm gonna bite you. I'm gonna swim up your pee hole. I'm gonna live in you. Wear you like a coat. Hope your guts are ready. Um, so none of them. Um, to humans from the consumption of insects, on the condition that the insects were handled under the same sanitary conditions as any other food. Allergies may occur. However, those are comparable with allergies to crustaceans, which are also invertebrates. Mm -hmm. Compared with mammals and birds, insects may pose less risk of transmitting zoonotic infections to humans, livestock, and wildlife. Although this topic obviously requires further research. When it comes to allergies as well... They are becoming so much more pro prevalent in the developed world for reasons that we don't quite know. We know that there is a link between, for example, the increase in uh, GDP of a country and the number of allergies they see in young children. So it's really hard to nail down, okay, well, this food stuff is definitely going to affect people and put somebody into anaphylactic shock. I do think, well, I don't know about crustaceans and peanuts, but I think a big part of it is exposure at a young age. Yeah. Um, this kind of like over sanitizing uh, your home, not that you, you know, your home should be dirty or anything, but not having exposure to things like pollen or uh, like minor uh, infections yeah. can cause you to become more allergic or more susceptible later on. Yeah, I mean, I was raised like the boy in the bubble, which is now, why Why now every uh, every summer when I'm back home in the UK, I am just like constantly like, oh, 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 and just like streaming out of every orifice and like sneezing every five seconds. Sexy. Yeah, it's not a great look. You, you should just go full uh, Facebook mom and be like, kids nowadays, they never get dirty. Let them go and roll around in the mug Let and play go with the bugs. Let them eat the dirt. Okay, so let's talk about some cons as to, like, farming insects or eating insects. Yes, it's not all blue skies and... Locusts. Yes. It can't all be locusts, <laughs> as they say. Nowhere. Uh, so, first up, one of the problems is that, as we as we alluded to earlier... A lot of these things now are being marketed in the West, but they're arguably they're being marketed in the wrong way, or they're they're being marketed as like an entryway insect or an entryway meal. And how is that being done, you might ask? They're being marketed as snacks, which are of course not meal replacements. Any any responsible parent will tell you having a snack is not the same as having like a full meal. So in terms of marketing, it's difficult to just uh, take away meat and try and replace it with insect. For some people, sustainability and health may be reason enough, but for most of us, it's unlikely. Courtney Borgensen, an anthropology professor at Montclair State University in New Jersey, says, quote, You can't just say, this source of protein you've been eating all your life? Well, you can't have that anymore. Here's another source, and it's got six legs instead of four. That will never work. They have to be as good as the thing they replace. And right now that doesn't seem possible. Mostly insects are used in the snack market, where they are dusted with flavours like sour cream and onion, or chili lime, or pressed into chips. They're also marketed as protein powders to dust on yogurts and put in breads. So, as we were saying, that might be the way that you get into eating an entire tarantula, but it's... <laughs> Alicia visibly <laughs> recoiled when I said that. But yeah, it's it's not the same as having, for example, cricket tacos or, I don't know, a skewer full of beetles, for sure, example. It's, it's not your main source of protein or your main source of, of meat. Exactly. It's a nice idea. Like if you had a dinner party, I think I was talking about this before, dinner parties seem like a good way to break out trendy stuff to people who haven't had it before because it's a talking point, right? Like it gets... It, you know, it gets the ball rolling. Sure, you're so, like, that that meatloaf you just had? Psych, it was vegan! Yeah. And they're like, yeah, I know. <laughs> if, but if you're the kind of person who is like, how fucking dare you serve me orange wine? Where's the regular wine, you piece of shit? Then you're not going to enjoy it when somebody breaks out the cricket tortilla chips. No, but I think uh, I'd be much more likely to try the orange wine if they also had red wine. That way, when I don't like the orange wine, I could be like, eh, 
kind of crap. I'm going to go back to the other one. So for your next dinner party, you need to be like, okay, guys, we'll help yourself. We've got Cool Ranch. We've got Spicy Cheetos. Uh, we've got some Cricket Chips. And over there, we've got... Yeah. So what or, was that third thing? Or if you're doing um, tacos, you'd be like, right, try these tacos first. They're, you know, they're ant eggs. And then, you don't like those? And, you know, we've got carnitas. <laughs> yeah. Or just have insect. But, okay, I didn't think you'd like the ant eggs. That's fine. Uh, just stick to the regular uh, mealworm. Here you are. Okay, so uh, there are also legislative hurdles. For example, Canada's nationwide grocery chain, uh, Lobias? Lobios? Loblaws? Loblaws? Lobbles? Their grocery chain, Lobbles. <laughs> I th- I'm going to say Loblaws, <laughs> has been stocking locally produced cricket powder since 2018. And in January, the European Union Food Safety Agency declared yellow mealworms safe for human consumption allowing producers to sell insect-based foods throughout the continent. Uh, Yeah, apart from in the UK now. Uh, Analysts at Barclays Bank now estimate that the insect protein market could reach $8 billion by 2030, up from less than $1 billion today. Still, that's a fraction of beef, which is currently $324 billion. That's a big old market. Yeah, and... You had mentioned this earlier when we were talking about, I guess, breaking insects into the mainstream that, you know, the big big beef may not want a meat replacement, basically. Sure. And, you know, I don't know how much they would lobby against, like, legislative laws allowing insects for human consumption, but it's possible. Yeah, I mean, look, cutting down thousands of hectares of the Amazonian rainforest isn't great news for the people who live there but if you're a cattle rancher that's great news for you and something like this is a real threat i think this is part of look guys i'm not trying to say this is the conspiracy okay like wake up sheeple we're through the looking glass but he does he just put on a tinfoil hat let me just uh there we go now they can't read my brain waves But I do think it's funny that this is, in theory, this is something that anyone could do, right? Like, earlier we said this could cost like $200, you could start your own cricket farm. In theory, that could then replace most of the protein, as well as the calcium, the amino acids, etc, etc, in your diet that you're getting from other sources, and cut down on your shopping bill every single month. Because we live in a capitalist society... That's not going to be great for everyone. It might be great for us, but it's not going to be great for big beef, big chicken, big milk. I don't know. Big pork. Big. Well, (laughs) that's my stage name. (laughs) It's a very weird stage show. I put on a pig mask and uh, I just roll around in, in a kid's bathtub full of muck. Yeah. Yeah. But those Japanese businessmen, they... They They fucking love it. Yeah, can't get enough. Okay, so most insects at the moment are raised to be fed to farmed fish and chicken or ground up into pet food. So I don't know if you know that, but your your precious little shih tzu is probably eating cricket. When you're like, Mincy, no! Mincy, get away from there! No! Don't! Mincy, don't eat that little bug! Mmm, that nasty! Oh, get that out of your mouth, you dirty girl! Yeah, she's already eaten insects. Ton of them. Yeah. Uh, according to Lewis Bullard, who runs the Farm Animal Welfare Program, he said, insect farming isn't an alternative to factory farming. It's a supplier. This usage further indicts the environmental case for insect farming. He argues, feeding corn to insects, then feeding them to chickens, is inherently less efficient than just feeding the corn to chickens. To be fair, this is more of an argument against current insect farming industry as opposed to what some proponents want it to become, which is a system to feed humans more efficiently. Yeah. And that's according to Vox. So it's a system that could be tweaked rather than completely thrown out. Yeah. So the problem right now is that insects are being used as food. They're an intermediary. And rather than feeding them to chicken and then eating the chicken, we should just eat the insects. Yeah. To misquote... Rick and Morty, that's just entomophagy with extra steps. Okay, so do insects have some sort of sentience? You know, is there a reason why we shouldn't farm them? 
for example, we know that bees understand the number zero and they can tell time. Butterflies can remember things from before they turn into goo in their chrysalises. Mm -hmm. And arguably, cows, pigs, chickens, and other farmed animals have a much higher sentience, and therefore they should be our priority. But it's something to think about. If, on the other hand, your concern is quality of life, consider how much does it take to keep a farm pig happy versus a mealworm. I mean, this is so this is my argument. It's, it's a, a relativistic approach. Because I would, I, I try and not eat a lot of pork, okay? I know for people who are vegetarian or vegan, it's like, come on, man, there is no try, there is only do. But, you know, when, when you live in a, a place like Taiwan, especially, and you are an expat, and you don't read the language fluently or speak the language fluently, it can be tough sometimes to get enough food in your diet and get things that you want to eat. Yeah. Also, um, you know, other meat sources aren't as big here. So it's a lot of pig, like a lot of pork. Yeah, there is a fair amount. I would say definitely when I was living in Korea, there was more. It was just like everywhere. It was in your toothpaste. It's crazy. <laughs> but um, I, I try not eat too much of that because pigs are incredibly smart, arguably smarter than dogs octopuses are incredibly smart problem solving smart um are they as smart as velociraptors i guess we'll never know but you know something to think about guys something to think about my, my point being that like on a scale I, I would feel more comfortable eating something like a chicken because okay yep yeah, maybe they can beat you at knots and crosses but they're they're never going to be like the next member of mensa and then going further down that scale I would feel more comfortable with something like, look, if you keep a bunch of chickens in a box uh, with the lights off, they're going to go nuts. They're going to start packing each other. They're going to get really stressed out. You shouldn't do it. If you keep a bunch of crickets in a box, you fucking love it. This is like a big long vacation for them. As long as they got little... Big old cricket playground. Yeah. As long as they got little cubbies and stuff that they can hide in, um, you know, and lay their eggs, etc. That's just fine and dandy, as far as I can tell. Basically, easier, free-range versions. Yeah, precisely. And also, to my knowledge, this uh, six week I, I see six weeks kind of quoted quite a lot. I think that's the, the length of time it takes for something like a cricket to reach maturity and then they're killed, essentially, for feed. That's, you know, you're not shortening their lifespan. Uh, and then they're going through relatively little distress uh, during the killing process. So... Even if they do have a level of sentience, I don't think it's being... I don't think they're being traumatized in the same way that other animals would necessarily be. And on the subject of sentience, I think the jury's still out on things like, do plants have feelings? Can they communicate to one another? Do they, you know, do they experience stress? Because if they do, then how ethical is it eat, to eat lettuce and carrots? I'm not being facetious here. Like, no, they do have... Uh, studies have shown that trees communicate with each other. Supposedly, the smell that grass lets off when it's being mowed is a distress signal to other, like, grasses. Oh my god, but it <laughs> smells so good! How bad does that make people say... You ask 9 out of 10 people on the street, what's your favourite smell? Oh, freshly cut grass... Meanwhile, there's a bunch of grass that's just like, Fuck! <laughs> Run for your lives! They're killing us! Mmm, smells like summer. And when you think about, yeah, coming back to trees, that just means that if you think along those lines, your house is just full of fucking tree bones, right? If you've got, like, tables and chairs, great. Enjoy your tree corpses, you sicko. But I do think it... It is about, like, a scale of sentience. Like Will said, we try to eat mostly poultry as opposed to, like, red meat or cow or pig. And to me, I I think, I know that it's not the same as being vegetarian, but I, I do think it makes me feel better. Especially when I see cute little videos of cows and pigs and, like, pets. I'm like, Minnie, Minnie, you taste so good. <laughs> um... It's, it's hard to, like, rectify what you see with what you eat. And I think with insects, it's probably a lot easier to be like, well, 
<laughs> I think it argu- it's arguably easier to be like, you've had a good life. Mm. You know, you, you've been raised in a way that's acceptable. So speaking of that, in terms of animal welfare, one insect-based snack company based in France, Jiminy's, has outlined their practice. They acknowledge that the research is ongoing in terms of insect welfare, but are erring on the side of caution. As such, they've outlined the five fundamental needs that their breeders follow. One, freedom from pain, injury, or disease. Two, freedom from hunger or thirst. Three, freedom to express normal behavior by providing sufficient space. Four, freedom from fear and distress. And five, freedom from discomfort by providing an appropriate environment. These all follow the five fundamental needs as outlined by the 1965 Bramble Report. And I think those things are, they sound relatively simple. I think those are relatively simple steps to take when it when it comes to farming any animal that you're then going to eat. Or any animal that you're going to take any resource from. Yeah, I mean, they sound pretty commonplace, but it's a lot harder to provide those things for a cow than it is for a cricket. Yeah, because cows just want you, you get a big enough stack of tub and you're like, all right, Bessie, get in, come on. Go on. And, they, and they, they'll just fight you. They'll just kick, you know, whereas a cricket, they love it. Now... Some of you might have asked the quite intelligent question, what about bringing bugs across borders? What about the potential for introducing invasive species? That is a very good question and a very good concern indeed. You should feel good about yourself. Yeah, because look, they tick all the boxes. Higher protein to fat ratio, check. Chock full of calcium and amino acids, check. Lower carbon footprint and water usage, double check. Let's build ourselves some bug farms. But before we do, consider the following. In a report published by the Department of Biology, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, as well as the Ecologie Systematique Evolution Université Paris-Saclay, I think think those two guys were working together, uh, the authors outlined some concerns surrounding introducing invasive species via industrial scale insect farming. Quote, the changes in thermal gradients, which historically prevented ectothermic species such as insects from invading colder habitats, have resulted in range expansions of many insect species and will open new regions for invasions to many species that are escaping from industrial insect farms. Okay, so if I'm right, what they're saying is global warming has caused temperatures to rise, which means Insect species that couldn't reach colder climates, couldn't survive in colder climates, now can. Yeah. Remember at the top of the show, you were talking about one of the reasons why predominantly uh, Caucasian countries or predominantly European colonized countries didn't have a habit of eating insects because they just didn't have enough of them. Well, that's because they're colder climates and those climates are now changing. It's also an issue if you introduce them into regions that they typically wouldn't have been able to reach previously. So if you're setting up bug farms in Australia, for example, which typically have very, very stringent policies regarding alien creatures for good reason, that's going to be a potential problem because you're introducing entirely new species into an ecosystem that they could thrive in, but is not ready for them. Mm -hmm. The authors go on to say, quote, What makes the species chosen for entomophagy exceptionally dangerous is that the traits that make them appropriate for mass rearing are the very traits that could also make them successful and problematic as an invasive species. High fecundity, generalist feeding and nesting habits, resilience to climate changes and fluctuations, low resource requirements and high disease resistance. So, Basically, it, it's the reason why rats are such a, a pest, right? Other rodents will bite you. Other rodents will spread disease. But rats, rats are just the best at surviving. Mm-hmm. That's and why they're a pest. They have such huge broods so quickly. Yeah, that too. I mean, they can produce scary numbers in a very short space of time. Fecundity. Yes, they are very fucking-dacious. The article also talks about the introduction of new pathogens from invertebrates, worth pointing out that these are new 
uh, not necessarily more prevalent or dangerous pathogens, just diseases that we might not have encountered previously. And, you know, as some of the earlier theories regarding the spread of coronavirus have alluded to, when you put species together that aren't used to aren't used to being together, bad things can happen. That being said, regulations between developed nations still lack sufficient data surrounding edible insects. There are loopholes, and sometimes different trade organizations will directly contradict one another. Final thought, factories can increase diligence when it comes to containment. But how can we stop them getting out if history has shown we can't stop them from getting in? Something we didn't touch on earlier is that the FDA, they approve a certain number of insect parts, rodents, rodent and insect excrement in various different food and beverage uh, items. Because if you were to throw out every vat of, I don't know, Greek yogurt that had a couple of cockroaches in it, you'd be losing billions of dollars every single year, right? So, guess what, guys? You have already eaten insects or rat poop or mouse poop in one way, shape, or form because one way or another, they get into the food preparation areas, which I'm sure are otherwise very clean and very sterile, but they're not 100% airtight. And therefore, you know, it gets introduced to the food chain one way or another. So if you can't stop bugs getting in, how are you going to stop them getting out? I mean, that was something that uh, I was thinking about while you're talking about cricket farming. Like, imagine you have a room in your house that you have like, a cricket farm in and it gets left open one day and then you have an infestation of crickets in your house. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the uh, in the Verge Science video, when they visited this Aspire company, the startup in Austin, Texas, the film crew have crickets on them because there are crickets not a large amount, but the the people touring around the factory pointed out like, yeah, I mean, so, you know, some of them roam. Uh, th- so there's like a small controllable number of these crickets that, that have gotten out. Uh, we, you know, we can't control for that. Those are the extra free range crickets. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another article that I read referred to, and I think it's referenced in this report, the exact number escapes me. I think it was something like 100,000 cockroaches which escaped from a cockroach farm in, I believe, Jiangsu province in China. So they were being farmed because uh, to this very day, cockroaches can still be used in traditional uh, Chinese medicines. So the farmer was hoping to make, like this was his nest egg, pun not intended, He had a large investment in these greenhouses, which, for whatever reason, I don't know if somebody was trying to bankrupt him, but people went in and smashed up these greenhouses. The cockroaches then got loose, and so he now has to pay thousands of UN worth of of damages to try and get, get the situation sorted. This happened a few years ago, but it does highlight the potential danger there. And obviously, cockroaches are (laughs) incredibly prevalent if they get out then they could be a real problem. So, you know, but you could also make the same argument about, I don't know, introducing pigs into a foreign food chain. And think about the amount of runoff that you get from pig and chicken farms that we just deal with. I mean, they get into our water supply, they can seriously damage, seriously damage the environment, but we just take it as part and parcel of Well, you know, I like bacon, I like eggs, I like bacon and eggs, so I'm willing to deal with thousands of gallons of runoff. What is it compared to a few bugs? Hmm. I mean, so this invasive species was something that uh, I was, I guess, not exactly worried about, but something that I was contemplating when we first brought up the idea of insectivorism and entomophagy. And all I could think is, you know, how prevalent red ants are and Mm -hmm. any other, like, invasive species in the U.S. and how easy it is for insects especially to thrive in in different places. And I think if just making a one-for-one comparison, like, if your herd of sheep gets loose, 
they are a lot easier to round up than if your nest egg of cockroaches gets yeah. out. Because you could be like, oh, there's a sheep. <laughs> All right, come here. <laughs> Imagine having to like go around the hills, like hunting for cockroaches. Uh, something. So an approach that they did, that they pointed out. You know, not everyone needs to farm cockroaches. Not, you know, you don't necessarily need to have cockroaches on your diet. When something that is potentially less damaging to a new ecology could be introduced in its place. One of the approaches that various trades, uh, trade organizations around the world have had in the past is blacklisting different food items, different animals, etc. Because they think it's going to be a problem. The issue there is that that's a very reactive approach. So you wait until you identify something that has already done damage. And then you say, okay, well, we will... No more of that, please. Yes, everything else can come in, not this one thing. What they suggest is a whitelisting approach. So they go through different species of insect one by one and say, like, yeah, okay, mealworm's not an issue. Okay, we can have tree beetles. That's not an issue whatsoever. Okay, but we do, we don't want tarantulas uh, or running at termites a, running or, amok. Well, you know, yeah, or certain species of ants, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I I think you know even though that's something I haven't heard discussed a lot in in terms of entomophagy, the idea of potentially uh, invasive species. I think that report makes some really good reading and it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't say that we just shouldn't be farming insects. All it says is, well, we need to think about these things first. And, you know, I think that's true of most things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anytime you're introducing something new, don't just jump in feet first. Think about it. Think about the ramifications. Yep. True for eating bugs. True for what what you and your uh, lover do in the nighttime. Don't just be like, hey, here it is. Talk about it first, you know, over a nice glass of cockroach milk. Um, hey, speaking of which, mm. we should make that announcement. <gasps> oh, boy. Yeah, that we teased at the top of the show. Uh, do you want to make the announcement? Because I know you're super, super excited about it. Uh -huh. Come on. Tell, tell the people at home. We're going to eat bugs. Yeah, we are. So... Practice what you peak. Practice what you preach, people. Yeah. <laughs> Off the back of this, I thought, how, how can we sit here and talk about uh, wag our fingers at people and be like, hey, if you want to save the planet, eat some bugs if we're not going to try it ourselves. So I did a little bit of online research. I found a company based in Taiwan that ship internationally. Uh, I, I might include a, a link in the, in the sources. And we had them ship a little goodie bag to us so in said goodie bag we have some cricket powder mm -hmm. which i'm planning on making some baked treats yep. using we've got a little uh pick and mix of different insects yeah dry roasted mealworms crickets uh i think may maybe some silkworms in there yeah and then the pièce de résistance, the dessert, if you will, we have some chocolate dipped scorpions. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. So more in the novel side of things, I guess. And we are not only going to eat those and tell you about it, but we are going to film that and we're going to upload it to our YouTube channel. So uh, be on the lookout for that. We do have to first procure a couple of items so that we can get our our filming set up looking. Just so, uh, so we can get some beautiful uh, close-ups and sexy shots of uh, our, our smorgasbord of, of, of bugs. And arachnids. Yeah. So do please bear with us, guys, but, but that video is going to be in the pipeline. I cannot wait. She's not been able to shut up about it, guys. She's just been like, when can we eat the bugs? And I'm like, oh, okay, hold your horses. Um, yeah, that should make, some, make for some pretty good viewing. Uh, should we do some weird old facts? Weird, wacky, wonderful, and wild. Yeah, all the W's. Do you want to go first or should I? You go ahead. Okay, let me just find my weird fact first. Uh, my weird fact is about silkworms. Uh, in other words, the larvae of the and domesticated silk moths. They are eaten in India, Korea, Japan, China, and Vietnam. They have even been suggested as a possible food source for astronauts since silkworms can be bred 
whilst in orbit. Mm. Okay, so you've got like a hydroponic farm, and then you got your silkworms for protein. Yeah, and you've got them kind of working away, spinning mm-hmm. the silk material for your, <laughs> for your space suit. So everything, everybody wears silk in space. Oh, sexy. You've just got <laughs> like a team of astronauts and then one astronaut who is auditioning for the next season of uh, Project Ru- Runway. <laughs> RuPaul, and they're like, tonight I'm serving space sexiness and then they go out of the airlock and then immediately like explode because <laughs> it looked hella like real fabulous but um did not did not withstand hard vacuum okay um i have i have two fun facts today because i couldn't choose oh wow um what a treat <laughs> okay so my first one was we were talking about how um if you live in like a really cold place, it can be difficult to to get the things that you want. Um, so in Alaska, native people have an ice cream that is made from berries and animal fat. Yeah, I think I've heard of this before. Yeah. Yeah, it's usually moose or caribou fat and sometimes ground fish. And I think people have pretty mixed reactions about it, but I'd be willing to try it. Yeah, I, I would try some... Uh... Some fatty ice cream. I imagine that adds like an extra level of creaminess, maybe. Mm. Maybe a little bit of umami as well. Sometimes, you know, sometimes ice cream can be too sweet. I'm <laughs> like, I want this to taste more like tuna. Okay. Um, my other fun fact is that, well, we were looking for a, a new eye for you. Uh, eye is for. Oh, yeah. Not I thought you physical... literally like. Oh, look at for a glass like eye. Optic nerve, yeah. Um, I thought about doing um, the Icelandic sheep roundup, but I don't know that there's enough for a full episode. Is that where they just do like their top 10 sheep of the year? So basically what happens in Iceland is that throughout the year, throughout the summer, the sheep are just allowed to roam wherever they want. They can go up the mountain. There's there's no effort made to like keep them in a pen or round them up every night. So... By the time it comes like shearing season, they need to round up the sheep. Mm -hmm. And how they do that is they get everybody in town to come together and they go basically send search parties into the mountains. They can stay like camp there overnight, get drunk or whatever. And then they have this kind of round pen with like the inside. They funnel all the sheep into the inside and then it kind of looks like spokes of a wheel, which each different little spoke is a, a different farm. And so everybody just comes in, grabs a sheep, looks at it, and then throws it into the correct farm. It sounds like so much fun. Like, it's just a bunch of people, like, having a huge party and throwing oh, sheep. Yeah. And then I guess some things that I've read that it's, like, kind of like a traditional setting for, like, a love story. Like, that's how you meet, like, your That's their your lover. Cute. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Say what you will, but the Dutch sure know how to have a good time. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. I know you're trying to make me uh-huh. do something, but... <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. That does sound like a lot of fun. That sounds like... Uh, I You I, you had me at sheep round up. I was like, that's that's where I want to meet my, my belle, my, uh, my southern maiden. I believe it's called a retir, but I, I don't know how to pronounce it because... Yeah. No, yeah, I think you did a great job. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Uh, I, <laughs> I throw time. Here we go. All right, well, we hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you've liked the show, please give us a like, give us a follow, and leave a review. This has been Enter the Rabbit Hole, as always, reminding you to... Eat more bugs! Yes, but only the ones that come out of a packet, and never the ones from uh, the back of your cupboard. No. (laughs) Unless they've been dry roasted. (laughs) All right, guys, take care for now. Bye-bye. Enter the Rabbit Hole is written and presented by William Grant and Alicia Palmer. The music was created by Glenn Marshall. More information and sources can be found in the episode description. You can email us at etrhthepod at gmail or follow us on Instagram at etrhthepod. Thanks for listening. Enter the rabbit hole.